Hi, everyone. I'm very excited and very honored to be here to be talking about in this very important topic. Um, my talk today will be about HIV and COVID stigma and discrimination. It's history repeating itself. Um, as with every epidemic, um, accompanies the fear um, surrounding it and the myths surrounding it. Um, and that often leads to stigma and discrimination. What I'll be talking about today is about a little bit about the HIV stigma and discrimination that we've seen and what we're seeing in the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal experiences recovering from COVID-19 and the next steps um, taking preceding these events. Um, a lot of us have been working in the HIV field and we're very familiar with the term stigma and discrimination. Stigma is a shame or disgrace attached to something regarded as socially unacceptable. So being different or being blamed for being different. And it's often attached to fear and stigma leads to discrimination. Discrimination is treating one person differently from another in a way that is unfair. For, for example, you're refused employment if, if you have HIV or you're refused to receive medical services if you have HIV. And we know that stigma and discrimination leads to negative health outcomes. Often those who are stigmatized are often marginalized from society. They're often subjected to harassment or abuse or violence. And that leads to poor social or emotional well-being, and that often leads to sickness. But what have we seen in the COVID-19 epidemic? Since the virus originated in Wuhan, China, following the events, we've seen increasing events of anti-Asian racism and xenophobia worldwide. There was this article on the New York Times about Chinese Americans who fear for their safety, were spit on, yelled at. A lot of fear was surrounding these topics and a lot of the people who were associated with the virus were attacked. There was also this issue about mass shaming um, in the US very early on in, in the epidemic. A fast face mask uh, was discouraged to wear. There was this article in the Times about um, a Chinese student who was wearing masks on a subway train and she gets odd stares from other commuters. A group of teens stared at her and coughed in her direction. I felt very humiliated and misunderstood, said that Chinese student. If you look into Wikipedia, you'll see a very long list of xenophobia and racism related to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there are some specific examples around almost every corner of the world, um, but I'm not going to go through all of them. Having read about these stories um, and these events that were happening, little did I know that, that I was going to experience them first-handedly. Um, I was traveling to the US very early on around February, March for a work-related trip. Um, and back then I was discouraged by a lot of people not to wear a mask when I was in the US because at that time, the probability of me uh, being violated or humiliated was seemed far more likely than the chances of me getting the Seems ironic at the moment. Um, but I was there and I practiced all social distancing measures and I washed my hands. And then when I, when I returned home, um, I was under home quarantine for five days um, and I started to develop upper respiratory tract symptoms, had a clear nasal discharge, no cough, no fever. Um, and I tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. So I was uh, admitted to the hospital but since I had a very mild case of COVID-19, I was there for a couple of days. Um, and then I was discharged to a quarantine unit, whereas I was patient number one in that quarantine unit. Um, and I, was, I would like to acknowledge um, the person who set up this quarantine unit is also one of the panelists today, which is Dr. Tanya Wee. So I'm very honored to be with her uh, presence today. Um, <clears throat> but that's just the beginning of my story. Um, when I remained the rest of my time in the quarantine unit, I returned home. When I returned home, I felt that it was uh, right to um, let the jurist person at my con condominium knew that I had returned. <clears throat> so um, I submitted my documents um, about my stay at the hospital, but also explicitly stating that these, con these documents were confidential. Um, but several days later, I received a letter at the front of my doorsteps. Um, from a lawyer representing one of the residents threatening to sue me and legal action. 
um, the contents of the letter said that I was putting my community at risk and my return was unwelcomed. Uh, I was very shocked at the time, um, very sad, and also very fearful about what was happening to me um, because um, at that time, my confidentiality was exposed, including my room number, my name, um, where I lived, um, and, I've, and people were also um, looking into security cameras about when I left my room, when I used the elevators, and all of these personal details um, were distributed to social, through social media circles. Um, and there were a lot of discussions going on at that time as well. Um, I had a friend um, who lived at the far south of Thailand who texted me about two or three months after I had returned home um, saying that, oh, you should be careful because there's, there's this one doctor who's living in your area who has COVID-19, please be careful. And I told him, well, that's me. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I've already recovered from, from the disease. So there were a lot of fear going on and there were a lot of mixed message um, going on as well. But luckily um, the, the lawsuit was dropped uh, because I called um, to talk with the concerned parties and to let them know that um, um, I have recovered from COVID-19 and it's not a chronic disease. But following the events and everything that has happened, it was quite traumatizing for me because um, I didn't feel like I was happy living there anymore, um, and nor that I feel that I was uh, welcomed um, about everything that has happened. So I decided to move out. But I realized that I was I wasn't the only one who was experiencing um, these events. There have been um, several reports after that about you know people who have been recovered from COVID nineteen and were unable to return to their homes. And I wasn't the only one. There were multiple events happening across Thailand. So I thought that this should end. Should end. Um, I'm in a position to do something different. Um, so following the events, um, my team at IHRI and myself, we wrote um, a new study, um, which is called the Study to Address Stigma and Discrimination Against COVID-19 Affected Communities through community preparation and public communication in Thailand. So we wanted to mitigate the risk of people experiencing stigma and discrimination and not be able, being able to return home by preparing communities before the return of COVID-19 patients and also disseminating public campaign, public online campaigns to address the knowledge gaps um, and hopefully to mitigate the risk. Um, but first of all, we wanted to also explore the prevalence and types of stigma and discrimination that people were experiencing. So that was our primary objective as well. Um, so this study was just approved by the ethics committee at the end of August, and we just started to collect data um, around September. So I have um, preliminary data to show with you, which is unpublished, um, and it's only in the group of people who have recovered from COVID-19. <clears throat> Um, preliminary data shows that you know almost all of our participants disagree that recovered COVID-19 patients to move out of their communities. 70% um, were worried that they would be disgusted by others. 65% don't feel that communities have the right to disclose personal information without their consent, but actually a third of them reported that these things were actually happening. 20% felt guilty that they have contracted the virus, and 23% felt it difficult to tell others that they have the virus. 12% don't want others to know that they have COVID-19. Uh, when asked about their experiences of stigma and discrimination, 14% um, reported that they were denied to return home to their communities after recovering or even asked to relocate. Um, a third of them uh, mentioned that members of the community expose their condition without their consent. And 4% have been asked to leave their job because they have COVID-19. So um, this preliminary data shows that stigma and discrimination is there. Um, and events are happening um, as we speak, not only just in Thailand, but probably around the world. Um, 
And we've learned from the HIV epidemic that stigma and discrimination is something that is very difficult to eradicate even after you know, 40 years of advocacy. Um, but we have learned from the HIV epidemic and we've, we, we know that stigma and discrimination negatively impacts the health of an, in, of an individual. Um, so we should be vigilant of the harm and the prolonged effects that it has on communities. Um, since we, we have lessons from the past, we should be able to work quickly to address um, the events that have been happening in the COVID-19 epidemic um, by utilizing social media platforms, disseminating of myth busters, and preparing communities and utilizing um, social public campaigns to mitigate this, these risks. Um, I just want to say at the end that we shouldn't let history repeat itself and we should we, as healthcare workers, we should be vigilant of the harm that it can cause. Thank you very much.